First, don't confuse level and plumb. Level means level as in water won't run off of it. Plumb means straight up and down. Imagine a radius line from the center of the earth straight out into outer space, shortest possible distance, that's plumb. A level will give you both of those readings on the job site. And believe me when I tell you, you have to have both of those readings on a job site accurately all the time. Now levels have come a long, long way. I have here an antique level by Sterrett. It was actually made before they started calling themselves Sterrett. My old eyes won't quite pick it up, but I think it says LS Company. But look at that. Look at the workmanship. And it still reads perfectly, both level and plumb. But don't drop it, because this thing's cast iron. And it just will not stand a trip off of the second floor onto the concrete floor. It'll be all done. Not only that, but I would guess it probably cost a carpenter 100 years ago, what, a week's wages to buy something like this? He only wanted to do it once, and so he wanted to make sure he took care of it. They have come so far since then. Let me show you a couple of other varieties. Wooden levels have been around a long time, often made of mahogany. The problem with wooden levels is wood is not stable and it'll twist and it will bow. This is a crick level and I bought it from a mason friend of mine. Wood levels now around here are exclusively the tools used by masons because they have to take a pounding. You can see that it's clad on the corners. He's even got a hook on there for hanging it on the edge of the block wall. Wooden levels typically are used by masons, and four foot is the standard size that they usually have. I don't even have an I-beam configuration level. Empire Maze came out with those early, and there's lots of them around, but they bend pretty easily, and so these aluminum box beam levels are a wonderful step up. When you go to buy a box beam level, and there are lots of brands, look for one that's been milled on both edges. If it's not been machined, if you can't see the milling, the fly cutter marks or whatever kind of a cutter they used, it's probably not straight. And if it's not straight, it's just not that much good. Now, the advantage of a box beam is it'll take a hit in one spot or another and still have a good chance of remaining flat. And it sort of protects itself better than, you know, the old I-beam configuration aluminum levels. But just because it's a good level and just because it's a name brand, don't make the mistake of picking one off the shelf and walking out of the store without checking it. Because even an unused level may or may not be exactly accurate. Let me show you how you can check a level in a store or uh, maybe on the job site after you drop it one time. Which, by the way, is good practice also. So let's say you're in you know, your favorite hardware store and it's time to buy a level. And you pick one off the shelf. If that shelf will allow it, or if you can find one that will, put this level that you want to bring home right on the edge of the shelf. And maybe, discreetly, make a mark at the end. Okay? The reason for that is we're going to be moving this level and we want to put it right back in the same spot. Then have a look. Oh, this shelf is a little bit out of level, or at least that what is what my level's telling me, in that the bubble is touching the right side of the vial. So once you're sure you understand where that bubble's come to rest, you pick the level up and swap ends. You put it right back where it was, flush with the front edge, out to the mark you made on the edge of the shelf or on the floor, and then you come back and look at the bubble. Exactly the same spot that level reads accurately in the horizontal or level position. Let's try this other one. Same spot, same length level, flush with the end. Same story, touching the right hand side, a little space on the left. I don't have to swap ends because it is mimicking what the other level told us, so I know that's reading good. So checking a level for plumb is the same thing, only different, right? This level I used for a long time, pretty good level, and then on one kitchen remodel it got me in trouble. The divider at the end of a refrigerator was not plumb, but it had red plumb, I thought. Turns out one vial is bad. Let me show you how to check a level for plumb. You come to a clean vertical surface 
and you set your vial as accurately as you can. And then you capture it against the wall and you draw a mark. And then you turn the level over. And you put it right back on there. I like to duplicate the top location. And you set the vial as perfectly as you can. You capture it. And you make a mark. And then you compare your two marks. This level is off almost three-eighths of an inch in four feet. One vial only. Now that's fine if you can keep track, but it's not worth it. It can cost you money, it can embarrass you publicly, and it can make a job that's already demanding even more frustrating than it needs to be. I go back to the edge of this coal box where we checked this for level to begin with, and I'm gonna pick the end of the level up to where the vial reads nice, okay? That's pretty nice. And then I come over to the end and I look in here and that is just about almost a quarter of an inch. A quarter of an inch and four feet is a sixteenth of an inch per foot. Now that's not much in a foot, but in four feet it's a quarter of an inch. And in eight feet it would be half an inch. And in sixteen feet it would be an inch. So think about what it would be if you were off an eighth of an inch per foot. On an eight foot header, that's one inch out of level. Now you say, all right, I mean, what's an inch? We're gonna bury that with sheetrock and we're gonna set a window in there. Well, if you leave that eighth of an inch per foot in place wrong on an eight foot header, you're gonna build a hump into that wall. And the second story wall is gonna have a hump in it also and the roof will have a hump and the fascia board will have a hump and the gutters won't work and the windows might not go into the opening. And so even a little deviation, like a little deviation can compound and grow over the construction process and over the life of the building. This is one of the big reasons you have to be sure you have faith in your level. You shoot for perfection. You don't get it, but you accept excellence. And that will be just fine. There are a couple more reasons to shoot for perfection and accept excellent. One of those is you have it where you want it. It reads perfect, but in the act of nailing or screwing or fastening, however it's fastened, it's easy for that perfect location to shift or be jarred or end up not being fastened in the place that was perfect when you started. But if you started perfect, it could well still be within allowable tolerances. It's kind of back to that notion that if you aim small, you're gonna miss small. And that's plenty good enough in standard construction situations. So when you're plumbing and lining walls or you know, working together and establishing plumb or level, as a team, you gotta make sure you're communicating clearly. You talk them through the process, a little more, a little more, oop, too much, back off a little, okay, nail it. And make sure the communication is clear and brief because it's not a time for a long-winded explanation of what might happen if they miss. They just need an exact moment to pull the trigger and fasten that thing in place. I got a spot in this old pole barn that really illustrates how a small deviation in plumb can project into a real sizable discrepancy that in a different building could have been a real problem. Although in this old building, it's just fine. If this was somebody's house, it would be a shipwreck. Let me show you. So on this wall that I recently sheeted, look how close the plywood sheeting is at the bottom. I laid that plate out so that the sheeting just ran right by the pole. Great. The pole is out of plumb. Now maybe part of it's just the taper of the pole, but by the time it goes up there, 16 feet, it's three inches. Now I'm just gonna hip shoot the math and say that's about three sixteenths of an inch per foot. Not much in a foot, but quite a bit in 16 feet. No difference in the pole barn, but a lot of difference if you're framing somebody's house. So we've been talking a lot about how to use a level to get things level or plumb. You can use a level to get things a prescribed amount out of level. You can use a level to set specific slopes, 1%, 2%, 4%. I don't think we're gonna go into the weeds on that right now. We'll do that sometime when I'm setting up some flat work. But while you're thinking about it, and until we come back around to that next video, 
spend some time realizing that there are eight eighths in one inch, there are 12 inches in one foot, that means there are 96 eighths in a foot. That means an eighth of an inch is real close to 1% of a foot. So enough about that. We'll do that in another video. We have a video that we've posted already about the merits and demerits of levels of different lengths. There are specialty levels of all sorts. There are levels with magnetic strips. There are little short levels. There are long levels. There are levels that are made for machinists that read to a precision that has no place on a construction site. You can use a level like that for leveling up a lathe or a milling machine to where it is perfect and checking it. So I'm giving you a carpenter's evaluation of levels, but suffice it to say they're a wonderful tool that will not stand being misused. It's not indestructible. You can't use it for a pry bar and you can't use it for a hammer, even though I've been known from time to time to make that mistake. In any case, if you check out the other video, you're going to know more about why we like a four footer. You're going to know more about why we like a boss stitch. And you're going to know more, perhaps, about the level that you ought to be thinking about buying for the project that you're thinking of. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work. New topic. Now that the spec house is long done, I want to give you an update on what Nate and I have been up to for the past two or three months and what is coming down the pipeline. There's been a ton of deferred maintenance here in the shop. I've had several big projects, air systems and, and uh, some dirt work out back and what else? Oh, the redwood tree that went down and just a lot of things that I've been working on and filming and that, that are, they're coming towards you. The same kind of content you've been used to, um, some deep dives and some, some interesting activities. Now later this summer, in fact, starting pretty soon, I'm gonna build a shop for my daughter and her husband and their family. And I know you guys like shops. And this is nothing like the spec house project. This is the kind of project that anybody could be gearing up to tackle at any time. And so we're gonna do some sort of a vil uh, video series on what it takes to build a 26 by 36 foot shop with, a, with an office in the back. And I think that'll be good and uh, sort of very relatable content for a lot of us. So while I've been remodeling and working around the shop, I mean, long deferred maintenance items, like I mentioned, Nate's been doing the same thing on our membership site. We've been talking about it a long time. And all of you who have been supporting us are about to get a major, major upgrade in what it is that we're bringing back to the community and are making available to you as supporters of Essential Craftsmen. In fact, tonight is the second, not just live stream, but interactive chat, a Zoom call that I had two weeks ago, we're gonna do it about every two weeks, where we all get together in a Zoom meeting format and exchange ideas and talk about projects and answer questions. And I'm not answering all the questions. The other experts, and you guys are all experts at something, will be available to field questions and dilemmas and ideas amongst ourselves. It's gonna reinforce and solidify the community of essential craftsmen, which after all is the most worthwhile aspect of what's going on here. Community counts, right? Now it doesn't count in the same way that family counts, but it's not a small thing, living a fulfilled life. So we are excited. We've been working hard in various uh, venues, and I think that you're gonna be pleased and uh, hopefully inspired in some way by some of the things that we're gonna to continue to bring to the channel. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman, and keep up the good work.